So let's uh, let's start the meeting. Uh, we usually try to see if we have a quorum. It looks like the committee's here tonight. I don't think we need to go around the table and and, and uh, take attendance. Everybody's here, right? Yeah. So everybody's here. So I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, I want to announce that this meeting, like all the meetings, have been uh, uh, recorded and will be recorded. If you'd like to get a copy of it. Uh, these cards will, will tell you how to do that. We have a stack of them here right on the table, so if you want one, pick one up. We encourage you to do that. But pass them out. Okay, pass them out. Good idea. Good idea. Uh, so, uh, as always, we have public comment, and tonight I'd uh, like... I gave him a bunch. Oh, all right. I'd like to ask the speakers to perhaps limit their, their comments to a couple of minutes because the board, this, this committee, needs some time, I think, to talk amongst themselves. Uh, we're under the gun to get this done by the end of May, and so we need some discussion for internal purposes. <clears throat> you are welcome to stay and listen to those discussions. But uh, as chair, or as my co-chair here, uh, we're not going to recognize anybody in the discussion during our internal discussions that are on the committee. At the end of the meeting, if we have time, if attendees would like to make comments about what they've heard, uh, we'll welcome those. In the event that doesn't happen, when we meet again, there will be a public comment, and you're welcome to come and share whatever comments you might have about how the meeting went or any other comments you want to make. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd open it up for any public comments. If you'd just give us your name and perhaps the ward you live in. And uh, Fred Zimlock, Ward 3. Uh, just clarify something that I said at the last meeting. And what I did is I brought up the issue of uh, the amount of area in the city. And what I did is I looked at Wiki, Wikipedia to find the area of Northampton. They have two values. One is 35.8 uh, square miles for the total, and then the land being 34.2 square miles. The DPW figure was 34.9 square miles with a excess of 0.7 miles squared, which is a 2.2% increase. It's not clear where the wiki number comes from. I don't know. But uh, my feeling is that this number is important because it'll be the basis for the fee calculations, and it's sort of like the LIBOR, where the LIBOR is used to calculate mortgages and that sort of thing, so people might argue about it. Anyway, I'd like to uh, thank the folks that were here at the last meeting <coughs> for being polite when I mentioned that the area of Northampton was six square miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's around 35. Yeah, no. uh, we can deal with that. That's okay. Comments? Does that suggest you, you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, just one other thing. During the during the uh, discussion, can we ask questions? Uh, no, I uh, we need I to. Mean, have it's up some, to you what you want to no, do. No, but we we need to have some conversation. You're welcome to listen at the end of the meeting if you want to have, make some commentary. Uh, we'd like to hear it. Okay. Uh, you're, they're also welcome to write any comments they have and send an email to Jim Marilla. Absolutely. Who will distribute it to the task force when he gets it. Absolutely. You could do that. You, want, yeah. you don't have time yeah. to come at the end, you want to weigh in, or you think of something you didn't say, write an email to Jim Marilla, city engineer, and he will distribute it to the task force. Promptly. Who has that email address? Who has that email address? Jay Marilla. It's Jay Laurela. It's L A U R I L A at Northampton. M A. Here, give him a card. You can you can just send it to me, and I'll get it to Jim if that'll work. Yeah, sure. Okay. There's there's Jim's card. Either one. I have a couple questions, if I could. Uh, I'm, I think there's some uh, new people here as well. So just so as a as a baseline. Um, this additional fee that's contemplated for uh, the uh, 
across stormwater management comes into place when? What's the, when does that start to take effect? That's an answer I can't, I don't have. The uh, city we, council we, we uh, have agrees to it and it becomes an ordinance. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, Mary Ann Labarge yeah, would probably we, have a We have a city councilor here and perhaps they're best able to answer that. I mean, our responsibility is to put a recommendation in front of the joint committee, uh, council committee and DPW committee on what we think is a fair and equitable way to do it. And after that, it's it's up to the city council to work this process through the various departments. So I don't, I don't have an so answer. So we don't know when that takes uh, effect. I could say that I believe it's a city council's hope. It will take effect before the enacted, before the end of this calendar year. C can our councilor member give us yeah. some? So that's the goal I've heard. We're what it has to do, Bob. Once it leaves here with your charge and your recommendation. It then goes to the City Council Board of Public Works subcommittee, and you heard Councilor Spector say that they are going to have public hearings. Then it will go to the Board of Public Works board, and we will encourage that open public hearings will be given then. So there's two Once letters before the City Council, is what you're saying? Exactly. Oh, no, one. The joint, committee, up, the the joint, joint committee and, and then, then the BBW. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Then that recommendation, recommendation will come to city council. And like Paul is saying, and I agree to, and I know many other councilors will, of best practices of having several open public hearings. And, but I, be, I believe that the, there are the Joint Committee would like to have an enterprise fund, if that's what we recommend, set up during this calendar year. Doesn't mean you'll get a bill during this calendar year, but they hope to have it happen relatively quickly. Well, we haven't been told that. No. That's my understanding. Well, at the last meeting was what? September 8th, 28th that was supposed to be due? Right October 7th, I think, was October when the... October 7th. Uh, yeah. I think the short answer is that the recommendation to the task force, if it moves forward through the process within the city, that if a new enterprise fund or something like that is, is implemented, it will be implemented at the start of the fiscal year. So it would either be um, not this upcoming fiscal year, but the following fiscal year or the fiscal year after that. So there's a bunch of things that need to happen, but the implementation of something like this, which involves funding and revenue and that sort of thing, would, would be quite <coughs> for the fiscal year. So that means you think the first bills might go out in the fall of 2014? I didn't say that. I didn't, didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. If that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. Probably be the earliest. And my second question is uh, determination of the budget. How is that being determined for this fund? Well, at this point, I don't think there's a fixed budget. Uh, there are some estimates of what we, we think it will be. But I don't think there's a firm established uh, amount at this time. You want to speak to that? Sure. So in, the, yeah. in the first meeting, Terry Colleen, the chair of the Board of Public Works, uh, made a presentation about um, the revenue needs for this type of enterprise. And uh, the number was about on the order of $2 million to meet the city's obligations for flood control projects and for compliance with um, pending stormwater permit that uh, EPA will be issuing shortly. So somewhere on the, the $2 million annual. Uh, revenue. So on an annual basis, the projection was $2 million? And that's to gear directly at what part of the city's improvement? Flood control and stormwater. Okay. Other comments? I do have another comment, but go ahead, Alan. I was just going to say, I'm going to reserve my comments. I'm, I'm new here. I just learned about this meeting. I'm here out of concern to make sure. I presume that money is needed. I just want to make sure that it's fair to people both in rural areas as well as that live downtown. So. Okay. 
So I had to leave early uh, from the other meeting, didn't hear all the proposals, but I, and I tried to go onto your website to see what those other proposals were, and frankly, I had difficulty managing it and getting the information in advance of the meeting to read it to be uh, better read on this. I can, we can email stuff to you, Mitch. That'd be great. Give me a, uh, a business card or something to be happy to send it. In, in fact, anybody here, we put stuff up on the web. There's a lot of information on there now, so it might be a little difficult to navigate, but we're happy to send things to people. I appreciate that. So my question might... That's an apology because my question might have been dealt with at the last meeting and just want to, uh, if it has, um, uh, mention that. So one proposal that I saw had to do with a tiered land area system. Uh, the more land that you own, um, the, uh, the, the rates change, um, and also for the commercial. And it occurred to me in the week since, in thinking about what you're trying to do, um, some of the assumptions that were put forth in that proposal um, kind of counterintuitive uh, in the sense that there are a number of houses in downtown uh, that uh, are on small lots that really have no uh, ability to manage water on site um, and they're having a greater impact uh, into the stormwater system and it seemed to be this tiered system was uh, maybe a better approach would be to think about square footage of our properties and uh, come up with a factor that you have that information existing in your database and you come up with a, a constant. That is how we're doing it. I'm that, sorry, what? That, that was presented. That, that was presented? Is, that's not how we're necessarily doing it, but it's one of the one of the models being that considered. must have left before you presented it. So in, in the interest of moving into sort of the actual, because I think we might cover some of the things that you're, the questions and concerns that you're raising, I think. But I won't have a chance later to talk about it. So I'm just curious if, not, if you are in public comment, if you could just quickly give an overview of what that would be. Um, well, well, we'll talk about these four models here, yeah. and you're welcome to That's listen. Purpose. And I think uh, when you hear this discussion, you'll see the various proposals. If after hearing that, you have some commentary, you can, we hope at the end of the meeting, you can get up and share that with us. Failing that, you can send comments to us. Then you can come at the next meeting. I don't know when that next meeting is, but we will decide that before we leave here tonight. Emery, is there a deadline for offering proposals? Not to my knowledge. Uh, yeah. Unless the committee yeah. uh, votes to uh, uh, limit the, the number of models or the submission date, which they haven't done, so unless some... I would, I would actually hope that we see another model based on our discussions where yeah. we come up with something yeah. that's an alternative based on, yeah. uh, on what we've learned from, yeah. from discussing yeah. it. I'd be surprised if we don't see an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Or two. Or two. Or more. Yeah. Yeah. But get them in soon. Yeah. yeah. But, but sooner is better from our, from our perspective. And who submits those? Anybody can. Anyone. Anyone. Uh, at this point, uh, the members have done uh, the bulk of the work on that, and wow. I need to thank the members on the committee who've mm -hmm. put the time in to do that, because it takes some time to develop models, but the four models we have have been uh, generated by committee members. Well, that's not entirely true. Terry's, 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 Terry's not entirely Yes, uh, I stand corrected. Uh, and one wasn't on the committee. But if someone else has an idea for a model, we are certainly willing to look at it. All we need is to be able to see it. And, and then we think about it and evaluate it and, and deliberate on it. So, Emory, again, just to, to uh, elongate my point that if we have four models and in two weeks someone presents a new model, are we going to reopen the public discussion and restart the process uh, after we've made considerable pro uh, progress on the four models that we have? that's going to, again, put us up against this uh, contrived May 31st deadline uh, mm -hmm. quicker than we would want to. And in fairness to the public, if, if people who are not here in the public want to come up with a plan, uh, are we going to tell them sometime later that we cannot accept that plan? And as Chris says, even the alternative plan could be an alternative of an alternative plan. Yeah. I can't speak to the issue for all the committee members, so I'll speak for myself. But in my opinion, if that were to happen, I don't know that it will, but if it did happen, even at the final hour, uh, and we were to go to the uh, council, we would take whatever recommendations we had and take the submission with us 
and say, look, at, we looked at best we could at these whatever number of models, and this came in late. <clears throat> we have the model, we've not had a chance to compare it to all the other models, but we wanted to include it in our recommendation to meet the date. I think that's our only choice. If they were to extend the deadline, well, then we'd have another choice. We could uh, evaluate it and include it. But I think any time up to the point we went to the thing, we'd be open to get a model. Whether we could spend time really deliberating on it would depend upon when we got it. Yeah, I think that would be fair. I, I really see this as an evolving process. We have seen the substantial modification of two of the models we got last meeting already. We're going to, any ideas people want to throw in the bin, the more the better is what I think. But we got to get them through. Mm -hmm. and, and we may then find ourselves, Chris may come up with mind's brain. Don't count going, on it. <laughs> at the last moment. <laughs> but, it, but we're always, but we want to get, I think the, Having the models we have is very helpful. The information we got from Jim and the staff was great, but we want more ideas. Yeah. And I see this with all the discussion. And what uh, what I'd like to do we have other public uh, comments? Our Could last question. So, how would you go about submitting uh, another proposal? Send it to Jim Larilla. Is that right? Yep. Or send I'll it to Jim. <laughs> send it to me. Send it to anybody on this committee. Uh, any any member here would make sure all other members see it. They'd get it to Jim. If you send it to Jim, Jim will send it to all of us. So, uh, Jim or anybody at this table. If I could just add one thing. I, it, I don't think it has to be a comprehensive proposal that covers everything. I think that if you find that there's something that we haven't covered or haven't covered in, in, in the right way, and it's very narrow and specific, that that kind of comment would be would be useful as well. That you don't have to reinvent the entire wheel, you can just add a spoke or two. Jim. Yeah, are we also saying with the same breath that no matter what comes in, we're going to use the $2 million figure? It has to raise that. Well, the $2 million figure we're just using as a way to model what it would look like in terms of evaluating whether it's fair and equitable. The $2 million may or may not be the but, final but, number, but, but what, we, we will use that $2 million number to evaluate the model. What I believe Jim is saying, in order for any one of these proposals to work and do the job that, we're, that the DPW is requesting be done, it's going to take $2 million a year. Right, and any of these proposals, you can vary the rate yeah. oh, absolutely. to make them produce yeah. that amount absolutely. of money. So it we don't endorse any budget. Yeah. We're just right, yeah, we, we actually, I think we have to be careful not to necessarily endorse the budget as, yeah. as the budget stands. That is really, that's the preliminary ballpark mm -hmm. yeah. that we're going to use. The, the goal is not to reach $2 million, but to develop a system that we believe is fair and equitable, which will allow us to raise $2 million if that's what we needed, if we needed one8 yeah, that would be one thing, and if we needed 2.6, that's right. another thing. But the principles of fairness and equity are the what we're trying to deal with. I'd like to, as if we can move on here, uh, and we had a visit to the... Uh, uh, just get to approve the... Oh, yeah, the minutes. Excuse the minutes. me. Minutes from last time, Move approval. committee members. Did you read and have got any revision, revisions to the minutes? Approval. approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Some members of the committee visited the pumping station. Uh, and is there any report or anything you'd like to get back to the uh, committee as a whole on I'd that? I'd be visit? happy to hear from people who'd never been there before. You too. I've never been there before. I've never been there before. And you I, too. I you? Had been there before yeah, so what do you guys think? Very impressive. Beautiful old machines. Yeah, for 1935. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually 70 years old. Yeah. Still works. It, it's amazing it still works. Uh, the guys down there seem to take care of what they have. They have to. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna need to look at those those engines and you know that facility. Was yeah, there was there any discussion about Breakdowns that have occurred during, you know, crisis situations. Have they had? We did issues? not. No, they they do. As, as Rick said, they're really they know how important these machines are to our yeah. city's 
Yeah, Join the, us. The biggest thing was, I guess, last year they had double alarm breakdown. Something didn't work. The alarm didn't work, and then the call center didn't work. Yeah. It was a, so it was communications breakdown, not a yeah. mechanical yeah. breakdown. Yeah, well, it was in conjunction with, with a, a mechanical, mechanical okay. Okay. Yeah. breakdown. So that was, uh, uh, I think, a very pretty rare thing. But it, I think it, it, you know, <clears throat> alerted us to, you know, things that we'll need to to make sure. I live right in that neighborhood, so, it's, so you can. <laughs> it's it's, yeah. it's important, important that we know. Yeah. John, yeah. what do you think? Well, I, I I left, and my commute was an hour and forty five minutes, and I just thought about what if it doesn't work? If if something in there, you snap a rod in one of the engines, and you need, you know, all the engines going, you can't replace it. So what happens next? And what's the time frame for that delay? And how does that back up up the river, in the impact that it places on the city? I think that's huge, and I think part of the transparency in setting these rates, we need to be clear that others know about that. I mean, we had to talk, but I think that's a big unknown. It's a big risk that, that hangs over the city, that if you go to start it and it doesn't run because you have one of the 100-year storms, Yes. what's the follow-up? It's, it's, it's astronomical. You uh, I'd like to just do a, do a small dissertation on what the flood station needs in my estimation, because that was my charge when I worked for the city. You're looking at equipment that's 70 years old. It's been maintained in top condition as far as the guys can go. But there are valves that sometimes get blocky when they're trying to be closed and don't close immediately. Uh, there are um, engines that sometimes don't start and it takes a little while to get them going. Uh, if you have a major breakdown in one of the gasoline engines, there are not parts readily available. It would have to be manufactured by someone if there's an internal part of one of those engines that lets go. It's time for that station to be rehabilitated. and. For the safety of the people in the lower portion of the city of Northampton, because when that pumping station was not there, and we had the 100-year flood, we had water up on uh, Pearl Street and uh, up on uh, um, Pleasant Street. So it, it was quite catastrophic. And if that place doesn't operate, you're looking at millions of dollars worth of damage. So, something has to be done. Can, can I ask Jim a question? When you say rehabilitate, Jim, are you talking about like replacement of current equipment, or are you talking about uh, full facility replacement? I think it makes uh, sense to look at everything, but I'm not necessarily saying that the equipment has to be pulled out of there and replaced. Uh, the valves can be rebuilt. The engines, the two gasoline engines in there, those are Sterling engines, uh, you know, triple carburetor, quad ignition. Uh, they're ancient, and, and they don't produce them anymore. So, you know, what do you do with those? Uh, somehow you either replace them with diesel, or you replace them with electric, but I, I think that you know, they certainly need replacement. Even yesterday, that, that when we were there, it didn't start on the first try. It didn't start on the second try. Mm -hmm. right. <coughs> what do you think, started. What do you think, David? Well, I, I think Jim hit it. Uh, actually, I think, Chris, were you, did you bring up the snowstorm? If we had 70 inches of snow, it would melt? No. <laughs> Someone did. <laughs> right. But I think Jim Jim's point, when he said catastrophic, uh, the only disagreement I have is, it will be hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage, not millions. Mm. It is a catastrophic event that's uh, right on our doorstep. And it, I think it's farther than Pearl Street. And it just, it, 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 as John said, it's overwhelming to see what that does and that we're at, we're at such risk in just one part of this whole process. It was, it was overwhelming. Mm. If I could just elaborate on my question to Jim. Um, the reason I ask is because when the discussion came up while we were there about rehabilitation versus full plant replacement. One of the things about that facility is that it's not to any code. 
Um, and if you were to go with full plant replacement, it would have to conform to fire codes. Um, one of the guys said, when all the engines are running, it's like it's like Dante's Inferno in there. Um, it, it would, when somebody asked the question, it's whether it would have to comply with the ADA uh, things. So if you go with full plant replacement, and I raise this because I want pe people to understand the order of magnitude of what some of these projects are. You're talking about a, a 15 to, to $20 million plant replacement. And I'm not saying that that's not a good investment vis-a-vis -vis the... You know, the hundreds exactly. of millions yeah, exactly. you're talking the about, the relative but, but that when we're talking about dealing with some of the problems that we know are coming down the road, two million a year isn't going to get us there. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to do it. So we're going to be look. So in addition to that two million a year, we're going to be looking for bonds. We're going to be looking for other forms of, of financing because these projects are going to take big bites, very big bites. Yeah. That one in particular. That one in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the most expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was a very, I was, I was pleased that so many members turned out. I was sorry you guys come, you guys couldn't make it, but we had a, a, it was a valuable. Yeah, thank you for putting it together. Like yeah. yeah. I would <clears throat> think, if I could say, um, it, I think it was very valuable. What you said, John, you know, I think struck all of us there that it, it's this pinch point in, in town and, uh, it would be good if we could get the, uh, the local television um, to produce some sort of uh, informational uh, awareness. Yes. Uh, we did have a photographer from the Gazette there, and I expect there'll be an article. There's, so we'll there's not a lot of uh, different components, so I think it'd be pretty easily understood by everybody what we're what we're facing in the, in, the, in the age of it. And, uh, yeah. So I, th I think that's something that we should ask the council to. You know, is one of the one of the things. Maybe not in this form, but as those meetings go forward. Yeah. In in concert with Terry uh, Colhane's presentation on the overall stormwater you know, infrastructure, yeah. that it's really you know you start putting all those pieces together. It was very it's very helpful. It is. Jim, if if it fails, do we have a mini Katrina on our hands? Absolutely. Oh. I believe so. So we're, just a, as a reminder, we're going to do questions at the end. Yeah, let's 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 take questions at the end here. Let's. The idea was that we, the board needs to deliberate uh, itself, and if you've got questions or observations, get them to us. At, you know, uh, at the end of the meeting, or send us a note, or what, whatever. Uh, there, is there more comment on the, the visit? The next item we had on the agenda to see if there were any new, uh, I chose to call them fee algorithms, but models to uh, uh, look at how to develop a fair and equitable fee. And we got some uh, uh, email from Jim on the four models that were presented to all of us that we'd seen. And, and I think possibly another one came in, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Jim, can you? Um, Rick Clark sent an email um, with yeah. some uh, ideas in it. Yeah. So, so I don't know if we call that a model or what. It was not. It uh, was not. It was just reaching out to Jim's uh, and Doug, uh, looking to put together an ERU model, which I don't think we have in front of us. I know Jim mentioned that CDM report. Um, Included uh, that or, or made some reference to an ERU type of model. So I think it, it would be important just to get that model put together. I'm glad to do it. I just haven't had time in the past week or two to, to do it. So um, I don't know if Jim, so, Jim you know, has that information. Do, do, you Jim, but do you get a chance to do that or not? <laughs> uh, in other words, should we take this I as an action item for the next meeting? That's, night, yeah, so. that's the point I'm trying to get to. Can I speak? Sure. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have copies of what uh, what Rick sent, and it's um, it was a presentation from South Burlington, and there's a couple of pages there. There's sort of a flow chart which engineers love, so I, I printed that out for everybody's enjoyment. <laughs> and um, there's also a Covington, Connecticut uh, discussion, and sort of a, a little picture of how they calculate their equivalent residential unit there, and a copy of Rick's email. So I have paper copies of people on the task force want that. 
we can I can send it around. Yeah, right. send it around. Um, yeah. So, can you explain to me what an ERU model? Uh, equivalent re residential yeah. unit, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the attraction. First of all, I notice it in a lot of utilities that, that I'm looking at. Uh, they use that uh, standard. And I think it gives oh, flexibility um, in adjusting the rate as we go forward because we have this one unit. Um, so if this year it's at you know three dollars or, or whatever it might be, uh, and we need more, more or less, you know, as uh, each year gets budgeted, um, the you know, Board of Public Works or whoever's going to set this rate can adjust it and people can see exactly what their uh, unit is. So if your house is the exact size of the, the mean uh, in the city, um, then you would pay exactly that unit. Amount. And then if, if, you're, if your house is slightly bigger or, or, or your permeable surface, um, then it would be, um, you know, slightly, it, it would be one ERU unit times 1.4. Some factor. Whatever. A factor, that's right. So uh, it, it's just a commonly used uh, system mm -hmm. for, for calculating stormwater fees. And, uh, you know, I want us to have that to consider, too. I, I'm not endorsing it. I just think that it's a, a good, good system. Can I speak to that for a second? Um, the, the CDM report, they did recommend uh, using an equivalent residential unit style utility in there. So if you go back to that document, in one of the section like five or something, you describe how you would do a calculation like that. Um, they're very popular with communities that start new utilities because they're uh, a fairly equitable way, and a fairly easy way of implementing a utility. Um, one of the downsides, if you will, of that is that it's based on impervious area only, so that it would be developed land only, people that own land with impervious area that would get a bill. So undeveloped land under that type of scenario would not get a bill. Um, so it's just something something to be aware of. But they are, as Rick mentioned, pretty uh, pretty common type of way of uh, starting a utility. If I could just ask Jim, is there something out there like a service unit, equivalent service unit, where it's a, a factor, a number that's derived by the cost to maintain um, whatever it is that you have? So we talk about the $2 million. You know, well, they come up with a service unit that then is multiplied out for square footage. Um, I, I've seen something of it, and I apologize I haven't had time to you know, dig think, into it. But I think it could probably be done that way. Um, personally, the equivalent residential unit is a it's, a it's a term that you've probably seen in some of the guides that were posted, um, but it's it's basically an accounting term. And it can be a little confusing to understand exactly how it works. And really, it just gets down to um, an accounting term relative to the amount of impervious area on the property. So from my standpoint, the concept is impervious area on a property. If I meet someone on the street corner and I say equivalent residential unit, it'll take me half an hour to describe what that is. If I meet someone on the street corner and I say you have 100 square feet of impervious area in your lot, then people kind of understand that. So in terms of terminology, I prefer just impervious area, not, necessar not necessarily the equivalent residential unit, which is more kind of a, an accounting terminology, but it's frequently used in literature. I'm sure everyone's seen it yeah. many, many times. I think that it sort of brings to the, to the top of the pile of, you know, what's, it's fair and equitable, and that's probably a good place to start, is impervious and, and pervious and you know, from a fairness standpoint, that's not a bad place to start because it's something that we do have some data for. We have total area. We can get pervious data. Um, so there is information available to start generating um, a formula. Is that inherently fair and equitable or not? And I guess, I mean, I think this is, you know, if we're going to start picking, you know, having some basis to look at the various formulas, we sort of need to define what our fair and equitable standard is going to be. I think that if there's one kind of property which is, does not generate runoff 
it is agricultural property or conservation area. So, I mean, we are, agriculture is critical for our community, our lives. It, on the whole, it doesn't make runoff. That's why we like agriculture and conservation area the same. So, I'm, all I'm suggesting is that whatever model we come up with, we might want to think about whether we choose to exempt agriculturally zoned land or conservation area, city owned conservation, or it could be mass Audubon too. So there, there should be some kind of flexibility for particular properties which are our best citizens, really, stormwater wise. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? 90% of the farmland is on the Connecticut River side of the dike. You would think about exempting the land outside yeah. the dike. That, I think that, that would, for me, would make sense. My concern with the open land and excluding that is that under light rain conditions or sort of standard stormwater, mm -hmm. great. 100 year storm, not so great. Okay. And if you go, you know, I always think back to Terry's presentation. If you took away the flood control infrastructure, how much of Northampton actually is covered with water? Yeah. And it was, you know, my recollection, it was over half, two thirds, because it backs, you know, it goes all the way up the mill. It just really extended very, very far up. Um, so, and so that to me is, you know, again, if we're looking at not stormwater quality as the driver, but flood control as the driver. Okay. But I think outside the dike, there's, I mean, that's, yeah. they get, yeah. they derive to no benefits. To get your figure, though, you have to take a look at what the highest plane of the Connecticut yeah. River has been. And I think that's been about elevation 121. Take the dike away and look at a topo map and where's elevation 121? That'd be flooded. Right. Yeah. And I, I think, I say this because it was so helpful to look at the, what the comparisons are for our four different models. But I, I noticed there were some properties which had a big fee that I didn't think was a good idea. Yeah. Let's, so, let's, let's, that, let's, I'm just raising, that's, I had that same, that same okay. feeling. Let, so. Let's see if we can, uh, do we have any other models that have come in? We have this uh, model that Rick has, is presented with us, and if there aren't, I, I'd like to move on here. Alex is uh, just a minute. I'll get to Alex. I'd like to move on to looking at these test cases, the bill cases that yeah. Jim pulled yeah. together. Uh, and with that said, uh, now I recognize Alex. I'm just curious. Uh, from my point of view, the uh, the model proposed by Dan Felton seems to be one of the easiest ones to explain to people in the Ferris. I was wondering uh, what the cost, it's, uh, the, the DPW has said that the cost of, of surveying individual properties in the city was a, was a big expense. I was wondering if you had uh, calculated a, an approximate cost to do that. Um, yeah, we, we figured, I said the previous meeting would be about $100,000, somewhere in that order of magnitude in order, in order to do that. And, um, one time cost? Uh, well, it would be a one time cost, but I have um, I've been hesitant to, to throw out opinions in here, and, and people will probably notice. But um, there's a couple of issues with, with um, calculating the exact impervious area with, for every parcel in the city. And the, the, the problems are the first problem is it costs like $100,000 to do it. The second problem is that when you do it by uh, GIS or aerial photography, um, and then you tell residents, like if I tell Fred, he's got so many square feet of pro uh, impervious area on his lot, Fred's gonna be out there with his measuring tape, and the next day he's gonna be in my office <laughs> telling me your aerial photogrammetry said that I've got uh, 150 square feet of impervious, and Fred's gonna have a calc sheet that says <coughs> it's actually 102. So. The concern that we have, or my concern about it, if you do it that way, is that um, you set yourself up for dispute lot by lot with every property owner in the city, because you're you're making the case that you're accurately determining impervious area on their on their lot. So people people, not to pick on Fred, but you know, I mean, if I get a bill, I'm going to be out there with a tape measure too, saying, "Hey, is that, how accurate is this?" And, and I think so. The the problem with that is that. Um, 
the first thing is it's expensive. The second thing is it takes a while to get the number. The third thing is that um, there'll be a lot of disputes that the city would need to deal with. And then the fourth thing is that it sets up the expectation moving forward, you've got this a very expensive database that you set up, and then moving forward, the expectation is that you're going to maintain that. So, Alex, you, you decide to put a shed back of your house, then, you know, I find out it's like a 15-square-foot shed. I need to somehow add that to your lot and to your bill. Bob Reckman here puts a little extension on his driveway, <laughs> sends me a note and says, you know, I got 20 square feet of asphalt. So I think the point is that um, the expectation is that moving forward, so you have an accurate representation of every property, and then moving forward, every time somebody does anything, then that database needs to be kept up to date. So it looks like a Herculean task to me to sort of maintain that, which is one of the, what I personally feel one of the, um, one of the beauties of, of Terry Colane's proposal, which is used, which has been used by many, many towns, which is sort of using, and, and actually it's uh, part of the ERU system that Rick has mentioned here too. It's based on an average impervious area for uh, different residential properties. So, you know, in that, you, you group residential properties of a certain size, you get an average. People are basically paying, um, you know, the same amount for, for, for a comparable impact on the system. So I feel, personally, that's, that's a pretty fair way of, you know, of doing it. Um, and it, it's done commonly, you know, in, in a lot of other utilities to do it that way. It's fairly easy to calculate. It seems pretty fair. The last thing I wanted to say about the um, doing it lot by lot is that it's a lot of money, and in the end, um, it may only make a couple of dollars worth of difference in somebody's bill. So if you do an average, sort of do an average for a single family, similar to Terry's or Bob's, uh, Bob's proposal, the bill isn't going to vary too much. It may not vary that much um, if you determine what the actual uh, impervious area is based on photogrammetry. So you have to look at how much money do you want to spend and how accurate is accurate enough for what we're doing. And it's really, that really is a question for the task force. And I think that gets, I think Dan's, that's, that's been a big thing for Dan, which is, you know, how do you present um, something that's fair and equitable that people can understand? And how accurate does it have to be? Dan made a, a good comparison in the last meeting, I felt, about water and sewer rates, which are things that we measure. We have water meters. You know, people get that. You have a water meter, you can see the thing tick. Take a shower. Okay, you know how much water you're using. But with stormwater, it's a little, it is a little bit more nebulous by the, by the very nature of it. Um, so the question is, what's a fair way to uh, develop a bill for people to pay? Um, so, and there's a couple of different, I think the proposals that are on the table are all, you know, they're all very good, reason, you know, reasonable ways of doing it. Um, but I personally have some reservations about doing it for all the residential lots. Can I just add one thing to that, which is that um, one, of the things, one of the things I think that Dan's proposal really gets to is the equity issue, because it is a lot-by-lot lot thing. But, but what I think Jim has pointed out is that we're going to have problems with data. And when you look at spreadsheets all the time, one of the things you know is that spreadsheets are only good as the data you put into them. And uh, so that, you know, if we're not able to update the database on a regular basis and, and keep it constant and do it for everybody, because I, I, so I, I, don't, I really don't think this is a one-time investment. Maybe we would do it like a census on a, on a decade, um, but you're still talking about a chunk of change every time you want to do it to keep the data even, even close to up to date. So I, I, it's got an elegance to it that I really like, but I, I'm just leery about the fact that we weren't, we're, we're never going to be able to keep constant on, on we'll, lose, we'll lose the equity because we won't have the data. Yeah. I, I, want, I think one of the constants that we can all use and on any model is lot size. And, and if you think about the city's assessors, the assessors have every lot size in the city. It's not hard to get that information. And it's something that wouldn't have to be recalculated by this group. <laughs> In addition, does, doesn't the assessor's office also has have the uh, information on every building size? 
that we could use the building sizes as a possible alternative? <coughs> Not size or building size. I'm not. I don't yeah. know. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. But they do. They do have that information. Yeah. Yeah. The assessor's square office yeah. Yeah. Square, yeah. has a square footage size, yeah. so we have lot size. We do oh, have yeah. a couple building of size. In, internally here. We have a couple of other things that are speaking to Jim's point that are concrete. That takes away the dispute part. That we certainly don't want to create a monster here for the city to be dealing with disputes. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that we don't really have, right, are the driveway. Is the uh, sort of paved portions of properties? Well, I mean, you have it in GIS to the point that you can get, uh, like Terry's example, or the C in the CDM report, you have impervious area for the residential lots that you can, the, the data's good enough to come up with an average for one family house, two family house, three family house, and, um, and come up with something that way. But I think to get down to the individual lot level is, um, you know, the, the benefits of that, I think. Right. So, you, so you do have it sort of on a, on a, you know, on, on a gross scale that you can use for averaging. Um, but again, that's you know, you need to decide is that is that reasonable for for generating a bill for for residential properties. Many many communities have done it that way. Um, and I think the GIS data that's available is um, for the first utilities. They didn't even have that uh, that level of information. It was more flat fee determination. Yeah. Sort of like West Fields, I think yeah. they may have just picked a number and said this is what people are going to pay. And then as GIS data became a little bit more available, then that was used for average. I, I think one of the advantages of the assessor's data, whether it's, well, let, let's, we can only have one conversation at a time, uh, is that it's, it's readily accepted by the community. Everybody knows it's there and they may go dispute the assessors from time to time. That everybody is pretty comfortable that there is the data, they know where it is, uh, they've seen it, they're familiar with it, and, and to me that's an advantage. It's, it's, you don't have to sell that to anyone, you don't have to educate, it's, it's a, kind of the background, if you will, of the community. People know about it, accept it. So, you know, it seems to me that we have a lot of data that you're really only missing a variable uh, of driveways, and it seems to me that that you could do uh, averaging. You, could, you know, look at a hundred uh, single-family houses and average the. Um, and the assessor's maps are kept up to date. Um, I mean, we we all get along on the value of property. God knows how you can argue over that forever. <laughs> <laughs> and we will. And will. In this whole mix, I just don't want us to lose track of the fact that we do have the one simple one that I put forth. We don't need to know the impervious area for any of the residences. And the one thing that you and I didn't get to do this week, Jim, I, uh, the information I said I'd bring forth this week about the apartments, the condos, the hotels, how Westfield calculated all of that. The way they do it is if there's three less than three buildings, up to three buildings on a, a lot, then it's considered residential if it has dwelling units in it. They don't count the dwelling units in the buildings. So if it's like an apartment building and it has 50 apartments in it, if it's one building, it's called a, a single building. Um, <coughs> if it's got, if there's three buildings on it, then it's called three buildings. Um, they that's how they calculate it. So they don't count it as a commercial if they don't do impervious um, area. If it's over three buildings, then they go over to the commercial side and they do it by their calculation by commercial. So that's how they figure it. Um, so if we added all that into it, then possibly we could go back and the alternate one that you did was really a lot better than what I did because, like I said last week, I'm not an engineer. The one that I computed was really skewed. The big improvement, I agree, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jim's was a lot better than mine. Do you have that um, summary sheet you could pass out of those? Cases. Does everybody have it? I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. But if we added those figures into it, it would probably bring the commercial side down quite a bit. As a percentage? Yeah. If we added in our the apartments and hotels no. and things that are in Northampton that aren't in the one. But that's going to. So this, and then we have, you know, then we go back to sort of fair and equitable because then that drives the cost to the business community in a, I think, a, 
uh, and institutions. And, 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 and institutions in an unfair and unequitable way. It would probably break it down quite a bit because you'd have more to add in so we could lower what they're paying. I mean, the one that Jim did is way a lot lower than what I did to begin with because I just didn't calculate it right on mine. He did an alternate one that's a lot better. I'm, I'm going to pass around here uh, uh, a spreadsheet. I, uh, did people, Jim or Doug do this? This one, the yeah. breakdown. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of lost in terms of where we are. We're a little, we little, a little, a little bit all over the place here. Yeah. Yeah. Which one is it? Um, do you want to? So we, we were on item number eight, which was discussion of new algorithms. Are we sort of beyond that now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I wanted to go to, to nine here and kind of pass this sheet around because when I looked at this, when you start to compare the different models, some of the issues about fairness and equity come right out. Because when you compare, pass it around, pass one model, compare one model to the next, so, you begin to ask yourself, how could this be? And uh, just to send it, we got from Jim. Just let him. Yeah. That right? Yeah. 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 That's old That's old eyes. Nice. Do people need to see these sample fee calculations for the different models? I don't. <laughs> Does oh, it's just one of these sheets. I have a quick question before we go on. When, when we break down the the uh, lot sizes, I see that we go from uh, just on this this uh, spreadsheet. Half an acre, and then half an acre to one acre, and then one acre to five acres. Wouldn't wouldn't it work better if it was less than one acre, and then one acre or greater? Or you know what I mean? We've got we've got a one acre lot in two different categories. In other words, and it's a, probably a technical thing. I'm not I'm not quite clear on, but. Well, no decisions have been made about this. I think this is a, a document yeah, that we can kind of look at and compare, and we may want to take our pens and cross out some 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 of the items. Yeah, this is where it says 0.5 to 1 acre. Yeah. Right? We've got 1 say. acre. This doesn't make sense. Well, there's two different models in there. That's the, the problem. Yeah. So, in, in the every single family house, there's, Terry has 1 to 5 acres. I have 1 to 3 acres. So I that's what's confusing. Acre and one to three acre. That doesn't right. make sense. Well, that's well, because they are part of two different models. Right. right. So they're putting right. them both in there so that you can. So you can do the right number in the right model. Right. That's why that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's that way in the, all three categories. So Bob didn't do a <laughs> yeah. one to five. He did a one to three. Yeah. So that's the difference between my model and Terry's. Oh, I, I said see. one to three, and after three, you you get I measured. I, I got it. I got it. It does confuse me. Do you want me to talk about this for a minute? Yeah, well, yeah, what I'd like you to do is just kind of go over and, and say, okay, here's what we what we have, and then you can begin to look at some representative properties. Um, all right, so I had a couple of things to say, which I'd like to, to get on the table. Um, we we had prepared sample bills that were um, sort of sample calculations of bills that we uh, sent around for each of the models that were submitted. So uh, Terry Pellane had sample bills we had helped him with, and we sent that around. And we did everybody else's model in that in that same format, and I think it's. Uh, oh. I think it's uh, the, the illustration of how those fees are calculated. I think is helpful to understand how the system works okay. and get a better uh, better idea of of what the bills are based on and whether you think it's fair or not fair. Um, so we did those sample calculations and then we did this summary table, which was the 11, 7, 11 by 17 that that people were taking a look at, and um, I had started to pull together um, a few. A few thoughts on. Do you have this one? <laughs> I've got a just a few discussion factors about each of the models, and no one's seen this because I didn't email. And if you can just pass a few of them around. Um, 
these are just a few thoughts that I had put put in the way of summary. And I, I think um, one of my observations is that um, the fees can be fairly complicated in terms of different factors. Uh, who gets a bill, who doesn't get a bill, whether you do averaging, actual lot, runoff factor, or whatever. Um, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit, but in this handout, um, I've just got a basic, it's sort of a, a little cheat sheet in terms of what the, what the fees are. So at the top of this page, you'll see that um, Terry Colleen and Bob Reckman's method were pretty similar. They were based on a shared commons fee and an impervious area fee. Every property gets a bill as they had proposed. Um, I felt that the fee calculation was relatively easy to understand and implement. It was fairly transparent from that standpoint, I felt. Um, there was a tiered fee for residential property. is more equitable than just picking a single flat fee for all residential property. Um, and tiered fee can be implemented pretty readily with the data that we have available at, uh, now. Fee for non-residential and larger residential properties, so commercial property and large residential properties, it's based on impervious, uh, impervious surface and gross area information that's readily available in GIS right now. Um, impervious area measurement for non-residential and larger residential properties requires a modest startup cost, which I think was somewhere in the order of $20,000, if I remember right. So Ruth's, uh, Ruth's method was based on flat fee for residential properties. Um, the fee was based on impervious surface of commercial and larger residential properties. Um, under, under this method, um, not all properties get a bill. So if you have undeveloped land with this method, you, you, don't, you don't get a bill. So in some ways, this is sort of like an equivalent residential unit style program where it's developed properties that, get a, that would get a bill. So it's, um, this meets some of the um, concepts that Rick was talking about earlier. Um, impervious area measurement for non-residential and larger residential properties requires a modest startup cost. So pretty comparable to the Reckman Colleen method from that standpoint. Um, and Ruth's uh, original pr proposal, um, based on the fee structure she had identified, put most of the revenue requirement on non-residential properties. And that, that shows in the table. Um, but the, I guess my conclusion about that is that um, the concept is pretty easy to work with and you can adjust rates and percentages in whatever way you feel might might be uh, an equitable way to do that between commercial and residential. So, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You can you can play around with it a little bit and come up with options. We had put one option alternative there for you to take a look at, but what really you can you can do a, a number of things with that. Um, and then I put a few bullets down here for um, for Dan Felton's method. Um, the fee is based on impervious surface and gross area calculated for every parcel. Um, the fee uses two or more runoff coefficients that require some assumptions. And Dan had asked himself what coefficients should be used, or how many, should it be two or more, and what should they be based on. And um, the fee includes a commons fee, which is a percentage of the bill for everybody. And um, the question is, how, how do you define commons and incorporate that into the bill? Under Dan's method, all properties get billed. Um, he was proposing or suggesting that the city property be billed and that those bills would be paid from the general fund. Um, this, this next comment actually is my own, it's my own opinion, which is actually the exact opposite of what Alex just said earlier, so I, I apologize for sort of interjecting my own thoughts here, but um, the concept in, well, the concept seems easy to understand but difficult to describe in detail. Maybe, maybe that's a better clarifying way of putting it for me. Um, I had a, a little bit of a hard time going through understanding exactly how a bill would be generated and it was really Doug who kind of ground through the thing and showed me how it was done. And you know, so it's, to me, I could look at Terry's for example and say, okay, this is how it happens. And then when I looked at Dan's, it's just a little more conceptually not so complicated. The details of it are a little more, the calculations are a little more complicated. So. I don't want to go on about that. That's my own um, my own issue on that. Um, impervious area, area measurement for all properties. We mentioned the higher startup cost, longer implementation time. Um, by appearing to be more accurate and, accurate and equi equitable, we talked about uh, potential disputes if people are expecting that the number is going to be down at a square inch on their property. Um, higher administrative cost to maintain the database moving forward. So th those were just a few sort of observations about about these um, programs, and I think the last thing um, I wanted to talk about, which is a little, 
I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go astray here for a minute. If, if everybody will kind of bear with me. Not too far astray, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Put a leash on if I need this. Sure. I'm going to talk about this anyway. I've got a handout for everybody, which may be behind that copy. No. Uh, can you get copies of this? Yeah. Off, the, off the server? Yeah. That's the... So much data. That's the table from the floor. So, this table uh, was emailed out in er early in March. And it's quite, it's, you can't see it from there, I'm sure. So I'll stop holding it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was table one from the stormwater utility fee. Um, document that was put together by the Interlocal Stormwater Working Group, uh, the New England Environmental Finance Center. And I had recommended uh, back in March that people read that document um, in detail and take a look at this Table 1. And what I had done is I took the Table 1 from this report. <coughs> I feel like this is important, so I appreciate you kind of sharing with me. Oh, and look, here's what I handle it. Yeah, that'd be great. So it was this. It was this document. So for those of you that took the time to read it and, and everything, I, I appreciate that. This is really a, a pretty good document in terms of describing the factors related to fees. Now the reason, the reason I want to go back to this is that you'll notice that in the task force members' comments, for example, um, Bob Reckman was describing tonight. Um, concern about bills for conservation land or farmland. Um, we talked about um, different fee structures. We talked about multifamily, uh, uh, multifamily uh, properties and how those get dealt with. We talked about we've talked about credits in the past and, and different exemptions. So the reason I pulled this table out again is that um, when we, if you go to the 11 by 17 table that has all the numbers in it. We're like diving down into the weeds like pretty quickly. People have comments, you know, how many square feet is this or that, or is this, <coughs> is this use code right or not right? And I think there are some basic policy decisions that are up at a little bit higher level that you might want to think about and come to agreement on. And some of the questions are coming up because we're starting to crunch the numbers. But I think Bob's comment about conservation land is a pretty spot on comment. You know, the, initially the task force says everybody should get a bill. But then when you start looking at the bills, like we um, dug it out in the line for uh, Grow Food Northampton, for example, they're going to be getting a bill for whatever the number was in that, in that chart. Um, some of the city conservation land, the Turkey, Tur Turkey Hill conservation land, would get a big bill. So, you know, these, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but I, I think it raises awareness that there are some pieces of property that it may or may not make sense. You may want to think about whether everybody should get a bill. And then, while I'm going on about that, I'll, uh, I'll say one more thing about billing city property. And um, I guess it relates, I'll, I'll pick on Dan because he's, he'll take, he'll take it without getting mad at me, I think. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or you maybe. Maybe. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, comment, the comment about the city getting bills, I think everyone, we've talked, the task force has said everybody should get a bill, the city should get a bill, people get a bill. And I think the thing to remember about the city is that the city doesn't really have any money. The city has your money, they have my money, they have your money, they have your money, they have your money. So if we send the city a bill, and, and Dan's concept was uh, if the city got a bill, it would be paid for by the general fund. But I think everyone realizes that there's no money in the general fund, that the mayor has just proposed to the city council that a, uh, an override be, uh, be approved to, gener to get more money in the general fund to pay for the city services. So I think the concept that if there's a bill for stormwater, there's really no money in the general fund to pay for it. So the question is, where would the city get that money? They would have to get it from you and me and you and you and you. And the way they might get it is by um, through the new stormwater enterprise fund where there's a, an indirect fee that would, would come up with the money that the city would then use 
to allocate to each department, to the school department, to public works, to whatever, so that they could pay their bill. So Chris uh, Hellman has used the term sh uh, shell game, <laughs> shell game, <laughs> which is sort of a which is sort of a regrettable term. Uh, I think, but, but, but it's a recognized budget but, term. But yes. it's, a, it's a recognized budget term, and I think um, the reason that I, the reason that I wanted to mention this was that it creates a lot of city overhead and sort of administrative shuffling if the city gets a bill. So every department will get a bill. We have to, the DPW, I assume, would generate the bills and send them out, and then each department would have to pay the bills, and then the money to pay those bills would have to come from somewhere, and it might come from the new stormwater utility if that goes through. So there's a lot of hand waving and things moving around, but at the end of the day, it's our money. You know, people that live in the town, it's our you know, it's our money. So what I'm trying to say is that <laughs> it might be easier and less expensive and less overhead if the city didn't get a bill. Just something to think about. I'm not advocating for it. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on on whether the city should get a bill for these things. And, and some of them do get a bill, go on for a little bit more. So if Burlington, Vermont, I think all the city departments get a bill, and they have the chance for credits. I was talking to Doug about this the other day, where uh, the school departments, for example, if they work stormwater education into part of the curriculum and in the science classes and things, they get a credit on their bill. So it can be an effective tool for behavior for the city, just as well as it can be for residents or commercial property owners. So it's it's something, but I just um, I felt like a little more discussion about that might be good. So getting back to this table, if if people think it's useful at all, useful at all in terms of organizing your thoughts, you could look at these factors and look at the um, the description in the document that goes along with it. If it helps you get your arms around all the all the things that go into setting a fee, and I guess with that I'll. So, uh, uh, it's not clear to me uh, whether. Alex or Jim has the most gray hair. So I'm going to let those two guys decide who wants to speak first and who wants to speak second. But they both had their hands up. And, and I'll defer to... Uh, you defer to the senior <laughs> man. To the old age. The senior man. It's been determined he has more gray hair, so you can speak first. Uh, actually, uh, you know, I, I, I'm looking at number 10 on this, and, and that's the exemption. Yeah. And no matter what we do... We're going to calculate four different ways of doing this. And after we calculate this out, we're going to take a look, a very serious look at exemptions. Who's exempt and for what reason? There, uh, uh, last meeting, Khan came in and, and uh, um, elaborated upon the work that he had to do on the new piece of, of property that he developed uh, for his home and all of the uh, water conservation measures that he implemented for, uh, to control the runoff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like um, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, has spent over a million dollars on retention ponds and have had a significant effect mm -hmm. upon what goes down into the brook on Riverside Drive and the flow. And I defer to Alex to elaborate on that. Well, I've said that before, that, uh, that we're going to have to make some a calculation that need to consider that. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, that entities have spent an enormous amount of money to, uh, had to, yeah. but nevertheless did spend a lot of money to alleviate uh, stormwater runoff. I wanted to add mm -hmm. uh, that to the commons, you know, that I don't, I'm not sure that the general fund was ever, I mean, the general fund also excludes Smith College, the nonprofit, you know, they, right. they there's no reason for the city to pay uh, to be charged because there's no equitable way. Part of the reason that we're looking at a stormwater fee is to bring everybody in, everybody who benefits from the system, to pay for it. Well, yeah, maybe sure. I'll respond to, to as that was part of part of my proposals. I I felt like from a fair and equitable standpoint, if you're looking at a utility, and that the city does already pay utility and currently has a line item in the budget for stormwater that, as a taxpayer in the community, I didn't want to see that two or $300,000 line item just get sucked in somewhere else without discussion and then get, you know, sort of not managed properly. So that was the basis for including that. And from a fair, purely fair and equitable standpoint, they're paying the other utilities 
why not this one? And you know, I, and I agree, actually agree with a lot of of Jim's comments about what I what I. I hope never gets called the Felton method or Felton utility. <laughs> <laughs> the Felton model. I'll have to. I'll have to move <laughs> out of town, and I don't. I love, I love yeah, living here. Yeah, we'll my, change the name. Don't worry. Is, we'll change the name. This is a great place. Anyway, um, but I do want to say that just all most of your comments is that it, it's easier for this for the DPW. Is is fundamentally is the basis, and I think that a lot of the data we have. And we generate, we're going to have to generate bills, and the few additional bills that you have to do for city property would not be excessive. And I'm just, you know, shell game and all of those philosophical questions aside, because I don't, I, I see that point, yet I still have this, this feeling of fair and equitable. And if you're, if we're charging for water and we're charging for sewer, then we should charge for the stormwater. That's fair and equitable. And I know the tax, you know, it's actually it's less fair to the taxpayers. There's no question about that because it, it only gets billed out to people that pay property taxes. It bypasses a whole bunch of people. But on the other hand, there's already this this dollar amount that is being used, that's being collected, that's going to just get sucked in, and I'm, I don't think that's correct. So. Yeah, we, we, generate, we generate a lot of bills. I don't mind producing a few more. That's, that wasn't really my driver on it. David? Uh, Jim, I, I appreciate you bringing up that. And Jim, I appreciate you bringing up the exemption part. So uh, with this proposal that is, is this public record now? The, the, or, or this document is public sure. record? Sure. If yeah. there is going to be probably X percent of something that's going to be exempt. So whatever that number is. And I'm not arguing what it is, but if it's five or ten or fifteen percent that's exempt, doesn't that mean that the five, ten, or fifteen percent gets added will have to be reapportioned to everybody else's yep. bills? Yep. So instead of representing this low side bill to people that yep. it's thirty-three dollars, it's gonna be forty-four dollars if someone's going to exempt some property from this. And so as people in the public see this, we always are selling them on this not so it's not this great charge except I'm not so sure John thinks his name yeah. here is a not so great charge but if if we're going to exempt things we should allocate this in in this line item so people know that there is something more than what we're representing here. yeah I mean that's if I could just say that's that's a really important point and one of the one of the reasons I'm sometimes hesitant to hand out one of these one of these types of sheets for discussion purposes is that it can be impacted in a large way by the way David's describing. So you can look at that, and someone's bill, so, someone could see, you know, Cooper's Corner is going get, to get a bill for a certain amount. That's not a real, I mean, that's that's not a real number at this point. It's just a, a draft. It's it's, a, it's just a comparison between yeah. the different rate structures, but they're all subject to change based on all the decisions that right. they make. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to make a comment here about this. You know, we've shared these numbers with a lot of people, and and. Once people have information, it's possible to use these the information for all kinds of purposes. And I would hope everybody understands that th this, we're in the modeling stages. None of this is necessarily real. We're just trying to get our arms around things. So I'd ask the committee members and I'd ask the attendees here not to take these numbers out and tell your, your friends or whatever that this is going to happen. We don't know if this is going to happen. It's a public record, though, aren't right? Well, it is a public record, it, it, it but is. it's a discussion record, and we should be represented as a discussion. So we may and, want to put for discussion purposes Yeah, for discussion stamping, purposes stamping, or stamping whatever. I'm not saying... People are taking... You're right. People are taking this as this is what they're doing. Yeah, they're, I'm not saying we can't talk about it right. to whoever, but we shouldn't say... Uh, okay. This has been decided because it hasn't been decided. This is in the process of uh, but it's working never, with that. Never going to be less. <laughs> Depends what the that budget be is. true. I mean, I, it I can't, does say draft. Can't, can't, yeah, I yeah. can't speak. To, it does say draft, but, but I wanted to make that comment. Ruth, have you got? I thought we'd just kind of go around the table and see if there's some commentary each person might have because I want all the team members to get a whack at this to have some. I think um, I've got to work more on, on my plan. Oh. 
<laughs> I, 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 never, I never get film. That's the pleasure of being the filmer. <laughs> You're on candid camera. Off there. Nuts. <laughs> no, I definitely have to work with, with Jim on my plan because um, I want to f work in the hotels and the apartments and the condos. I think that'll make a big difference on uh, what we come up with for the um, commercial side of it. That'll bring down those rates some. Um, I think that's basically it. I did talk last week. I said I would talk to Westfield about their credit book. I talked to the engineer in Westfield. Westfield's plan is being revamped. It's not working for them. So they're revisiting their entire stormwater system, uh, redoing the entire system from, this, from scratch. They've offered to talk to us, to work with us, the engineer that's doing it. Um, if there's any reason we'd like to uh, have the benefit of their um, what they did with their initial plan, because they've been through this process once already. Um, if you think it's... Be, if they want to write a flare, that'd be great. Yeah, if there's any, anything you think we can get yeah. from it, he'd be willing to, to talk to us. Um, he also said maybe he can learn something from what, what we've been doing already. They don't have a credit book. Um, they're doing everything on a one-by-one -one basis, even though their, their um, ordinance says they have one. Do you, know, do you know why they're redoing it? They're, they're not, not making enough, enough money. money. They're not making not enough money. money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Either too low. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, hmm. um, Alex, I just uh, quickly uh, back to the comments. Right? I mean, you can you can look at the city's road uh, streets and roads as part of the uh, uh, stormwater system. The conveyance. Of yeah, it funnels. Uh, right. It funnels the water. It's a, probably the chief uh, way water uh, stormwater is funneled in the city. Um, it just, it, it just you know, we all benefit equally from using the cities. And I think conceptually, uh, we're going to exempt people for other reasons. Uh, perhaps conservation land. We're going to exempt some kinds of farmland. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't see a problem in exempting a city land. City roads. Chris? Um, I want to go back to what Jim was saying about um, item number 10 on, the, on this one here. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to it too, too late, but I spent uh, a good portion, a, good, a goodly amount of time over the last two days um, looking at some materials that Doug gave me about how various communities handle uh, credits and incentives. And tomorrow you'll have a memo in your inbox on, on this. Um, I think that. that Moving forward, 10 and 11 are actually going to overlap. For instance, what Jim was saying about Cooley Dickinson Hospital, that would, it, to my mind, fall under a credit, credit yeah. um, as opposed to an exemption. Um, I really appreciate what Jim said about if it's outside the, 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 the levy system, it should be exempt. I mean, once he said it, that's a no-brainer. You know, they're not obviously they're not contributing to the runoff situation, and and so I think as we move forward and we get closer to our goal. I think we should really try and figure out what are the other no-brainers. And uh, Bob's comment about conservation lands, I haven't quite gotten a no-brainer on that yet, but I'm leaning heavily in that direction. And I suspect that there are people who have other ones that once we yeah. hear them, we're all going to go, yeah, that's mm -hmm. obvious. So anyhow, um, I encourage people when you get this to take a look at it, and, and hopefully we can put it on the agenda for, for next go-round. We can and will. John? Uh, I just brought up good points. I, I think if we could go through and look at the ones that are out, it will make the decision much easier. You know, when I first looked at this, of course, I focused in on that last yeah. piece of college because that came out yeah. of the budget meeting. Yeah. Right? But I do want to make it noted that currently in the facilities budget under my domain, we are spending over a million dollars on some of the dams and levees that come through Smith. That I don't know if that's publicly known, but that is a huge I don't know if it's an exemption, I don't know how you define it, but that is something that I would certainly bring forward saying as we look at a lot of these other businesses, as we put some of these potential fees in front of them, what's the follow-up? What's not going to be given back as other things that they may be contributing to the city? So I think we have to be very cautious um, as we look at some of these, these fees because some of them you know, fifty-four thousand dollars to a car dealership or something of that may be a big factor, and they may take away from something else. Maybe not. I don't know. But I know in Smith, some of the dollars that we're investing now, we need to vet that through. So it's just back. 
and yeah. you're in the ironic position of actually doing work in the riverbed, right. in the Mill River. Every so five years, of yeah, the $2 exactly. So that's investment a, of dredging, practice. right? Yeah. Right. However, still benefiting. I, I understand, but there are a few from the rest of town not that's flooding, right. <laughs> that's right. having sewers, <laughs> having a pump station, all those things. You'd be really screwed, though, if the Mill River... <laughs> no, I'm all set. Okay. <laughs> Rick, I think I said the only smart thing I could say once. <laughs> <laughs> well, what Chris was saying, and I'm looking forward to that, uh, <clears throat> for the exemptions and the credits, or your thoughts about that, because what I'm... Well, I didn't give any thoughts. This, all this is, is it, it's an inventory of what other communities are doing. Right. I did not, I didn't put any bias into it. I, I, I will probably come prepared next week to say something along those lines, what I think are the strengths and weaknesses. <coughs> but the, all you're going to get is, this is what I learned. That's okay. right. Well, right. well, me too. Last night I was looking at a couple of uh, utilities and their manuals for credits are a publication. Um, yeah, that's know. another committee. Yeah. yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other <coughs> whole other task force uh, to figure that out. But what Alex was saying as well, you know, in, uh, when you have a sewer system, these are all closed pipe systems that come from your drains, and you want them closed. With the storm system, I think we're venturing into new territory and trying to raise <coughs> money to take care of this this issue, the flooding as well as the storm um, condition. So. Alex is absolutely right. The streets themselves are part of this conveyance system for the stormwater. So when we get into exemptions where I know someone mentioned at the last meeting, I, I, I watched it, I wasn't here, but um, you may not even have a catch basin on your street. And uh, being charged anything may become uh, confusing uh, to you. So I want us to, to think about the. I, I've, I've had a problem with this concept of uh, paying a separate commons fee. Um, because I, I do feel like we're all, this is, you know, it's like uh, we live in each separate room of the house, but we all live in the hallways, too, and, and we need to take care of that. <laughs> so um, having a separate commons fee seems, um, I, I, I appreciate the concept and maybe, you know, the idea behind that, but um, I, would, I would like us to um, kind of move away from, from separating that, and certainly I, I don't think that we should have the city paying, um, on, in my opinion, on, it, on this fee from the general fund. It, it, more than a shell game, it just seems, that doesn't seem uh, like we what we want to do. If we have a budget item, uh, a line item for, for stormwater currently in, in the general fund, I think we, you know, can certainly put that to use. That's not going to get lost into the schools. That's not. I mean, we need to, you know, be um, honest about that. So um, that that's my concern that that we're going to focus on the common areas too much when we when we want a simple, um, transparent, uh, easy to understand uh, system. So that, that's just my thing. And, and the other thing about the the, the streets themselves. I would like to see, um, you know, more money put towards streets in town. So, I don't know how how much of a finesse sort of maneuver that would be to consider the streets as part of the conveyance system uh, with all the catch basins, and it would, to the public, give uh, visible um, uh, results from this from this utility uh, if we were considerate of the streets and the curbs themselves as as part of the stormwater system. So, hmm. you know, I know your experience in that. Um, you know, I don't know how you think about it. I, I'm looking forward to asking yeah. you about that. But, you know, it's something else I, I just want us to consider. And maybe it's not at this forum. And maybe it's further down towards the city council that, that how this money is used. I know that's not our, our task. But I, I do want us to think about uh, what, what Jim was saying. That we, you know, it is our money. So, uh, Having to come out of the general fund seems to thwart what we're trying to do. So, that's all. Well, one question I keep coming back to is, um, just throughout the discussion, is if we plan to recommend a cap on how much um, this, how much can be collected in a year on this fee, 
um, just because the number of projects out there is huge, um, and I, I think that would, I'm interested in seeing a cap, and I think that would also then create that line item in the city budget, um, would also then definitely be used for stormwater infrastructure, um, just because they might need it <laughs> um, if we cap the, the fund. Um, so I'm interested in that. I know we had a little bit of discussion about that, but we didn't really get to that yet. Um, and then I just had a quick question about properties that are outside the levy. Um, do they contribute to the problem that we are experiencing? Why the F or um, EPA is oh, is um, regulating us? Why we now are going to have all these fees from the EPA? That portion no, the of farmland. the stormwater issue. That's a good question. That was yeah, that's a really so good question. They, is there out? Do they combine from the sewer to an outfall that ends up getting sampled? Probably outside the Amherst Forum area, right? There's some areas outside. Island Road, um, limited. Okay. The fairgrounds. But so on the whole, they're outside the city's flood storm water system. Okay. And then I just found these discussion points from Jim to be very helpful and to help kind of start guiding us towards, you know, making some decisions and start narrowing um, where we're going. So, keep on the timeline. Um, as attracted as I am to the quantitativeness of Dan's proposal, I'm convinced by Jim's argument that that's not the right way to go. I don't, and I'm going to speak here for Terry a little bit, I don't think Terry or I feel very strongly at all about how we tier these residential property sizes. There could be more sizes. I don't think we have any strong feeling at all. Um, I do think that we should talk seriously about exempting agricultural land, conservation area, including perhaps Mass Audible, for instance, another do we put in cemeteries? There's a bunch of things we're going to have to think about, properties which we could exclude. And once we do that, we're going to see the numbers come out differently for different for all the different customers of the utility. Um, I do think it makes sense to put in a common fee. And we have to figure out what that would be if that's what we recommend. And I think one extreme example is the commons should be all the roads and streets and sidewalks in the city, whoever owns them. Because the state and the federal government have huge amounts of that. And so we and that we can't charge them for that, right? But it's all part of our stormwater system. So we could take a very expansive view of what the commons is. Um, or we could take a more limited view, of which was less. And that's the difference in our between Terry and my model, because Terry's model says the commons is 21%. I say it's 30 And we certainly can talk about whatever the right, if we choose to move ahead with this kind of model, what the right number would be for the commons. Wait, so Bob, does uh, the Audubon own anything inside the dike? I, I don't think so, no. So That might be the way to get around it. Yeah. Well, well, as chair, I think my job is to make sure we get to some kind of consensus and, and deliver a product to things. So I, I don't, uh, I'm just going to try to guide the meetings and make sure we get there. And I'm not going to uh, impose my uh, opinions one way or another. I think that's a proper thing. Uh, that's I, but I want to guide the, as best as I can. So we've heard from everybody around the table. Uh, and I'm, and you know, I'm more than willing that we could hear from everybody again. But I wanted to make sure every person on the committee uh, got a chance to uh, to voice their opinions or share anything. Now, if there's more general discussion you'd like to have, I think we ought to have it. Or, or if there's some specific point somebody wants to pursue, uh, now is the time. Are are we at the point now where you want to take each model and calculate out the amount of money that? it would uh, bring, and then after that is done, seriously look at exemptions? Well, if, Jim, if I get this wrong, get me right, okay? 
I'm not sure. When I look at <laughs> when I look at this document here that we see, as as the calculations were done, everybody got to about two million dollars. In one case, I think uh, in Ruth's original thing, she raised more than that. She got two point six million dollars, which was really more than we're looking yeah, for. But I was really skewed. When no, I no, did I understand. That. But all the rest of them, what you see on this spreadsheet, got us to the roughly two million dollar mark, and that was only because we decided that as a marker we could have picked one million or three million or whatever. Uh, but when you look through the representative cases, in some cases you see big discrepancies. You know, I mean, for example, if you look at, we'll go to Smith College because that's a fairly exciting uh, thing. You, in one case, it's sixty-four thousand dollars, according to this model. We've not that's not sure. actually, fifty-eight thousand, one hundred thirty-eight thousand, eighty-two thousand, and thirty-eight thousand. And there are some other cases when you look in the data here. You see that. Well, it seems to me until we extract uh, the exemptions or the credits, it will be very difficult to uh, get to where we want to go. And so I'm thinking that the next meeting, I'd like the members to come forward with the list of exemptions or credits or exemptions, credits, however we look at those, uh, and see what that looks like, and then we can start to apply it. Jim? I think what I'd add to that is that, um, you know, this table with the 11 factors, I think you get the sense that there, there really are a number of decisions that you need to make, and, and every individual decision will have one in, impacting the numbers on the sheet. And I think um, each proposal that was submitted, we were going to call them 1, 2, 3, and 4, but we decided to keep the names. Maybe Dan wants us to change the numbers. <laughs> but, um, but each proposal that was made, I think, has some good things about it. And Chris had said early in the meeting that it might be a marriage of certain concepts in each proposal that you decide to do, or it might be something totally new, or it might be one of the proposals in its entirety that you really like. But I think um, what you need to do is to, is to consider the concepts that go into the proposals. Does a tiered residential fee system like uh, Bob Reckman and Terry presented, does that make sense? Yes, okay, I like that. Or does an individual property <laughs> determination, um, such as Dan has suggested, does that make more sense? Does that seem a lot fairer <laughs> to you? So you can make, you can go through each part of it and sort of make a decision. Does a runoff factor, I mean, sometimes use these runoff factors that Dan has proposed and they're successful. It's something that people can understand. I mean, it's a, a fairly straightforward concept. So do you decide that I really like the runoff concept factor that Dan's, uh, Dan has suggested that we use? And then you can you can start to put these things together and make up your own mind individually what, um, you know, what are the things that you think will work? What are the exemptions? Um, I don't know, it seems like people are getting some soft hearts now in terms of some exemptions that we didn't see earlier in the meetings, which seems fine to me, but, you know, everyone can come up with your, your own list of exemptions or possible credits. And that's why I felt like this table and in, in in the document that goes associated with it um, is a good tool to help you get your arms around all the different factors that go into the fee. And then if you come in and have a discussion about um, some of the specifics about them, like we love the tiered thing that Terry did, or we love the thing that Dan did, or Ruth's proposal on the flat fee. You know, whatever it is, if you come in and have a discussion about some of those specifics, you can probably reach consensus on, on a number of these different things. And then once you know what those are, then you can go back into the numbers and, and see how they work out. Um, my, my big thing, I'm an engineer, and you know, I love spreadsheets. Dan loves spreadsheets. We, we love them. But um, <laughs> sometimes you need to start up here before you get down here. And, and, and that would be my suggestion whether you want to try that or not. But I think I would look at sort of what are these policy things that we're talking about? Who's exempt? Who gets a credit? Who gets, you know, what, what are the different things? Figure out what these things are, which really doesn't have anything to do with numbers. They're real po really policy type decisions. Come in with the things that you feel strongly about and then have a discussion about that. And then once you reach some consensus on these policy decisions, and then you can go back to the spreadsheet and kind of work through the numbers if it's uh, a combination of things that are proposed or something totally new or, or whatever it is. So, so my suggestion is start here, work down, rather than looking at 
a comparison of the specific fees and then seeing how the different factors would impact each one. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that's how I would view it anyway, based on um, you know my experience in dealing with stuff like this. Well, I think the spreadsheet is is looking at this and looking at this table at the same time really points out some uh, stark comparisons and you have to figure out, well, now, do I really like the way that is or not? And then look at this table one, I guess it's called here, and say, okay, which of these factors kind of drove it this way or another way? And Other comments here? I have one question David? for clarification. Is it the charge of this committee to decide who's accepted or that there should be exemptions. To recommend specific our, possible exemptions, it seems to me. Our charge is to recommend. We only to, have the to power recommend to recommend. Which? That there recommend are exemptions anything. or specific exemptions? Uh, I think we have the power to do either. Yeah. We don't have the power to decide. Uh, there's a key <laughs> difference here. We do not decide, we, but we can recommend. Okay. And, and we, could make, we could go forward, in my mind at least, and recommend all four of these alternatives if we wanted to, and we might force rank them, or we might not force rank them and say, we've looked at it all, here are four possibilities, here, council, go do it. Or we can go with one. I think there's... Okay. Chris. I, I want to I respond to Dave. I think that um, we can approach the recommendation thing with regard to exemptions in a couple different ways. One is, <coughs> we can say, it ought to include whatever, whatever formula ought to take into account that certain properties ought to be exempt. I don't think that takes us far enough. Um, I think at the very least, we ought to have a discussion about what types of properties ought to be exempt. Uh, we may not want to go as far as to say specific properties should be exempt, but that, but that we come up with a general rubric for how one might visit this issue. Because if, if we don't narrow it somewhat, our, our, our cost modeling, our, 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 our fee modelings aren't going to work for us. So I think we have to, I think it, we almost are forced to go a little bit deeper into it than just the the idea that exemptions ought to be included. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So what are the other categories you think of which might be exempt? Go ahead. I'm the wrong guy for this because I, <laughs> I, I pack everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Alex? I still think, uh, I, I agree with the, uh, obviously that the uh, exemptions and credits are going to make a difference. But as a ratio, it's, you know, the chart shows very interesting stuff. If you look from one uh, the numbers will change, but not the the relationship particularly. So that uh, you know that. that uh, Give us an example. What you're doing. well, a half a, a, a under um, a co you know, on, on Bob Reckman's and Terry's plan, a half an acre would produce eighty six dollars. Under Bob, it would produce seventy eight dollars. Ruth, it would be as a fixed flat fee thirty dollars, or up to to ninety five, but. Felton's, which is a, which is a, a real look at the, at a, concrete number, which is even even if you're going to argue about um, what's, uh, what's permeable and what's impermeable, I still think that that gives you a good idea of what if you're, if you're a fact-based, um, detailed fact-based uh, rate. And it shows a considerable seems to me variation and you go down and you can see that uh, in a lot uh, a lot of places um, and you know what kicks out are those huge open spaces Turkey Hill conservation land yeah. Yeah. becomes you know you can't use that right you can't do that but you know in general uh, it's it's it, I don't know it just seems to me again I, it's hard for me to get away from a yeah, that's the that's the area that you have. That's the impervious area. Uh, you set, you know, it's a relationship that's that no matter how you uh, you know whatever the exemptions or, or credits, those relationships will stay the same. Well, it highlights the fact that impervious and and, and impervious uh, are big contributors, right? I mean, that they're real drivers. To run off. More comments? It seems like two two areas that have come <clears throat> up as something that we could potentially get 
discuss and get beyond. One is sort of the commons issue. There's, there seems to be a debate brewing about what to do with the commons. And then the other is, and it may only be, uh, that might be a quick one, is whether or not the city should be built. Um, and that might be something that we can get beyond quick. But I'm thinking that I know those two have had have absolutely some, some polar uh, opinions. Maybe we can nail, nail through those because the, both of those actually have a significant impact on how it's calculated. Particularly the comments, and and I think there's a, there's good argument. Depending on what formula you use, <laughs> to exclude or include the comments, it's very important in one form. It has it doesn't it means nothing in my formula. As it turns out, it doesn't really factor in. Right. You can eliminate it. It's you know same thing, you know with the city. Take the city property out, and you just raise the rates, and everybody goes up. Proportionally the same. All the proportions stay the same. Right. So, so maybe those are a couple areas that we could discuss and actually come to some conclusion on. And potentially the cap as well. I think that's another whether or not we want we want to mm -hmm. make a cap part of of our proposal and how that would how that would work. I mean, those those are three important things. For the sake of moving along, I'd like to make a motion that we not consider a model which involves the city paying the stormwater utility directly. So you want to make a motion to that effect? Yes. <coughs> Does somebody want to second that? I would second that motion. No offense. <laughs> None taken. Okay. I may even vote. <laughs> you say directly, you mean out of the journal fund? No billing of the city by the fund. Okay. Discussion on that. Wait, we are right now making the decision that the city does not pay a bill. Right. That, that's what we're going to recommend the city not get a bill. We're going to well, recommend well, that. Yeah, making yeah, a decision yeah, on our recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. we, this committee, would be making that decision right. if we vote. Yeah. Oh, depending on how we vote. <laughs> it depends on how the vote comes out. Of right, course. okay. Discussion on that. Well, I'd like to make the, um, the ERU um, you know, spreadsheet represent that. Um, that the city not pay the bill and get that ERU assigned to all commercial property and residential property and exclude city. So that might be a, a way of representing that um, option without billing the city. Yeah. ERU is a separate, that's an entirely different cost model. Yes. So we're just talking about whether or not the city pays a bill. Going to pay a bill. No. That's, that's, the, the that's the motion on the table. So going back to your comment of common areas, are they well, in or out? But it's one of the talking points. <clears throat> We're just going to do the city, do we charge the city? Right. Yeah. Does the city get charged? I just want to think practical. I mean, would you go back to Jim, you're talking about, um, I hate to use Shelton again, but you're billing the city. The city's going to bill us on top of that. You're, the city's got all the administrative costs of, you know, handling the money, paying the bill. Uh, collecting the money, all the administrative costs and everything that goes along with that, which also one way or another comes back to us. It's I know it's not exactly part of this, but it's all part of the bigger picture overall. It, it saves a lot more money besides just this in, in the bigger picture if you don't include it in this. Yeah. That's why I don't want to include it. If I could elaborate a little more on what you're saying, is that would be an administrative fee out of the treasurer's office, exactly. out of the collector's office, out of the mayor's office. Um, did I forget anybody? There's a couple <laughs> other office, tax collector's office. Yeah. Uh, that administrative fee would come right back to the fund yeah. as a part of the cost. It's, yeah. it's a shell game. Mm -hmm. it is. Um, I, I, I've actually, I've actually. We're I, going to change his name to Shell. I was, I was, I was all about the city paying um, at the beginning, and part of it had to do with the fact that they pay the, the other utilities. Um, I've come to the conclusion that we don't have to replicate bad ideas, um, and and that um, that the whole point of creating an enterprise fund is to capture um, everybody's everybody's part of this and get away from this idea that, that we will rely just on property taxes. And if the mechanism for 
the city's payment for its share is through the general fund. I think it, I think it runs counter to what, what the creation of an enterprise fund is really all about. So. We're getting there, Dan. More comments? <laughs> do, do, do you want to vote? Good question. Well, didn't, yeah. didn't we originally vote that every, didn't we have a vote similar to this, but in the opposite? Yeah, we did. we did. We yeah. did. So we would be we would be countering that yeah, well, that vote. Thank you, Rick. Changing our mind in public. That's that's another way. Of it. We'll, we'll, we can deal with that problem after we get the vote done. I think. A little bit. Uh, call the question. Call the question. Okay. Questions been called. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. Of what? Right. That we're not including it. Yes. Right. We're not all in favor of not. Billing the city. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one abstain. That's me. What about the uh, and, uh, and now opposed? Two opposed. Hmm. So it's eight, two, and an abstention. Now let's go back to this question. Uh, what do we want to do? To make sure that we don't revisit this, or do you want to be able to revisit it? I mean, it's it's your committee. You can do this back and forth as many times as you want. Alex, well, I won't speak to that particularly, but I I'm very interested in the new calculations. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to see them without the city paying a share, without the city paying a share. To see Dan's model without the city, without right. the city built in. Right. So to keep Dan's model set up. But it has just be private property. Right. So no general fund. I think Jim sent that out. Actually, I had done that today. Oh, yeah? Okay. In that's anticipation what you, of, that's what you sent out this today? Might, mm -hmm. This might happen. So, and like I said, everything goes up proportionally. Okay. What it does is it, it part okay. of it, it takes the, what was the 25 or 27 yeah. percent? It takes it up to 45 percent. Okay. So. Does anybody need a copy of that? Yeah, I have to. I would just like to say it's a quarter after seven, yes. and I'd like to make sure that we get a chance for the public to, to yeah. ask questions. Um, so just, uh, just to bring that up to, what, to your attention. What I'd like to do, well, let's finish this comment about this document that yeah. Ann is talking yeah. about, and then we'll go to that. Emory, I'd like to make a motion that all non- uh, all nonprofits are also excluded. Somebody want to second that? Well, I'll second it for uh, purposes of discussion. I so we have a motion that, to exclude all nonprofits, and 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 it was seconded by Alex. So discussion on that. I would like to hear the reason. Uh, I feel that if we're going to talk about exemptions, and now we're uh, originally we had voted to make sure everyone was uh, included. We had voted on that. Uh, and now that we're breaking that apart, that we should break open the whole discussion and, and get everyone into have some skin in the game. So if we're going to exclude the city, uh, I oppose that, but I, I appreciate the Democratic vote, that now that we're opening uh, that to, for instance, Smith College, who made a very valid claim to why they may not be, and as we represent these numbers, that I would like to see, you know, a, a, not a worst case scenario, but a more accurate case scenario about how that will affect the rest of the numbers. And if we only exclude the city, and we know that there are going to be some other exemptions, as uh, Bob brought up, it could be the Auto, Audubon Society or anybody else, you know, that we need to represent that. Uh, when we come out with this new data. That's the reason I did it. Alex? Well, I, I, I oppose it um, uh, because uh, I think that the city property is unique. It's something that uh, the entire city um, benefits from, uses, uh, that nonprofits are all over the, I mean, that, that's churches, uh, Smith College, the fair. Yes, lots of uh, VA, lots of people who yeah. use 
news who have specific uh, constituency <coughs> benefit particular people, but benefit from the system. And I would, I think, maybe on a case by case basis, that a, 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 a case could be made for a specific nonprofit or specific. I don't know. You know the conversation is on, but to exempt them uh, on a blanket, no, I wouldn't. I don't agree to that. Uh, and I, I would hope our system would have a generous credit arrangement for the special expenditures like Smith College has made. I'm not saying they should, I, that we want to have, encourage good stormwater citizenship. So we want to have credits, but I would not exempt them, no. Ruth? Yeah, I would, I would feel the same way for the nonprofits. They could get a, possibly through the credit system, a percentage based on maybe a percentage of the citizens that use that yeah. non-credit or some way, maybe um, one of the, the educational facilities got a credit in one of the cities based on teaching about stormwater through the school or something like that, but it could be done through the credit system rather than just on a blanket exemption. That's how I would feel about it, too. More comments? I just think it is a case-by-case -case examination. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I think that <clears throat> we need to, to look at each, uh, each case. You ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All in favor of exempting uh, all nonprofits? Raise your hand. All opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I get it right? Eight? Everybody. 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 Okay, so unanimous. I was, I was converted. <laughs> <laughs> I think we also, before we leave tonight, we should also set some tasks for Jim for our next meeting. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, I, agree. Good. I, I agree with that. So. The honeydew list? <laughs> yeah, now. <laughs> Yeah, the Jim do list, not the honey do list. Uh, one of our members uh, wants to make sure that our, our public attendees get a chance to speak. We've had a tradition of wanting to end uh, the meetings promptly. Uh, and so with your agreement, what I suggest is we get the action list for Jim done. And we decide when the next meeting is going to be, and then we take some time to hear from the attendees. And if we run past 7.30, so be it. But we're not going to be here at 9.30. So somewhere between 9.30 and whenever, is when we'll finish. Is, is that acceptable to the committee? Yep. That's fine. If uh, there's a, it would be acceptable. I, I would propose a friendly amendment that we give it an extra 10 minutes. Fine. You could even just add an item on the end of the agenda and have another um, public comment section, an actual item on the agenda. Yeah, we, we can do that. Uh, so what, what's the gym to-do list that we want done? Run one exemption for agricultural land or another one for uh, conservation areas. How do you define agriculture? Don't dare call. I don't know. He'll figure it out. We don't need the to define that. We, have the just, city has to yeah, define we don't need to figure that out. Now. But we, he can do that. I bet. What yeah. else? We'll we'll get to look at the numbers, and if we yeah. want the numbers <laughs> adjusted well, to city. include more, yeah, we can. City, yeah, exempting the city. We've decided that. Yeah, but that's decided. Else, I, it's still. I think it's up for some significant discussion. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just saying we we had numbers based on what are some other categories. But what are well, we going to? What are we going to do with the numbers? I guess that's my question. So. We take that out. Everybody else's number goes up. We know that's going to happen. Right. Is, is it going to affect our decision how much it goes up? Or is it really, is it fundamentally, is the question, is it fair and equitable? And do we need to go, you know, I think it's, you know, we're, as soon as we start playing with numbers to, to guide the yeah. decisions, yeah. that's a really slippery slope. I, I would I don't think strongly discourage that. Right, okay. And I think we just keep in mind that we're coming up with a formula. And you adjust the formula to, just to, make, to make the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I would suggest uh, homework for the task force rather than me. Um, 
in terms of thinking, in terms of, in terms of thinking about the proposals that were made and the, the aspects of the proposals that you like. Mm -hmm. I think each one of them has some benefits and some nice uh, pieces to them. Um, think about which what parts if you like one in its entirety or parts of parts of them um, that you like. Maybe go back to table one and, and think about some of the other factors that go into uh, making a decision about them. Um, and, and bring bring your thoughts. I mean, I'm happy to run other scenarios that people want to see. Uh, Doug's happy to run them when I ask him to do that. <laughs> um, so, so would, would you be willing to reproduce this document as, as actual representation of the group, as not just your view? If I got that information from the group, okay. I'd be happy to. Great. I don't think it's too biased, is it, Dan? No. Let's let's talk about the n next meeting day. Week from tonight. Location to be determined. Yes, we we're here because we couldn't find an alternative space, but we'll try again. Uh, this wasn't so bad, was it? No. Well, you want to be here again? A little tight on the a little tight on the public. We're, we can yeah. find a big we can find a bigger room. This is. Yeah. What do you find the police station. Is. So we're talking what, about the second. Yes. What, what would the committee what? like to do? Police yeah. station. Oh, no, that's not a good place for the public. No. You have to get out into the community for the public. Okay. Next Thursday it is. JFK was great. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. was fine too. JFK yeah. was a really good. And one. Nothing was really available tonight, and I, I apologize for that. That's why we're all kind of crammed in here. But um, we'll see yeah. if we can find a better spot. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll look for a. More commodious yeah. surroundings. Yeah. Uh, at, at that meeting, I, I would like to ask the committee to come prepared to vote on this issue of the comments. Let's let's see if we can wrestle that down. I don't know exactly how to do that, but let's come prepared to try to do that. <clears throat> I would suggest that we take table one and and this spreadsheet that was prepared for us and look at them and. Uh, come back with some ideas and perhaps even, I won't say rank, but uh, look at these models and decide which of them that we think fits best. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe there isn't just one, maybe we've got to amalgamate one or more. But come back with a, uh, a firmer idea of, and, uh, and maybe we'll take the names off when we don't have the particular models. We'll keep, that's we can keep track of them, keep the names on them. <laughs> well, I, I understand that, and that was a good reason to do that here. So did we pick the second? I'm sorry, did we pick yes. the second? Yes, May 2nd. So I'll try to find the... Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and Dan, there was three things you wanted to get done. The, the billing of the city, we took care of that. You wanted to do the comments, and there was a third... Uh, the cap discussion. Yeah, uh, and let's come prepared next time to deal with the cap. So when we leave next week... Uh, try to put those two things behind us as best as we can. And so my question about that would be, do you mean a cap in the bu the total budget to feed the thing in a rate? Because that's I not in our authority. I don't think we'll be able to do that. Or no. a cap on the rate, which is not in our authority either, or a maximum fee that any one institution Individual would have cap. to pay. Yeah, There's all kinds of things we don't know. Yeah. And, I, and we don't have any authority over any of them. No, no, but we, 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 we can recommend. We can recommend. We can recommend. We can recommend. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So it can be a recommended stage cap. That yeah. The first year right. is yeah. a cap, and then it yeah. goes up yeah. the next year. But we don't have to recommend an amount. We can just simply recommend there ought to be a cap yeah. and yeah. not, not yeah. quantify it. And with the cap, right. maybe who decides? Yeah. Perhaps yeah. City Council versus yeah. DPW. Yeah. 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 Maybe a time period. As well. Yeah. Um, I've well, seen yeah. that as yeah. where it's. When I say cap, you have a lot of freedom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't yeah. have to be exact. Yeah. So we've got the meeting, we know some assignments, and so now let's open it up to the public for any comments they'd like to make to us about the conduct of this meeting or any comments you have in general. I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions. Number one, has anybody attempted to gain any money from our congressional leaders for our sewer treatment plant? Ned was talking There's about that. There's plenty of money out there being floated around all over this country right now for sewer treatment plants. 
Go on the line and look and see where they are and how much they're getting. Okay, this is clearly not an issue for this committee's discussion. I think well, it's an part of the it's part of the need to raise the money. But it's not part of creating a fee structure for our moving forward with the stormwater. I mean, I think it's an important question. I think I think we have to think creatively about how we're going to fund these types of things. But it's. It, I don't see how it fits into our discussion. If, if uh, you were given $20 million today, uh, tomorrow, for the sewer treatment plant, for a new plant, would that not be a better thing to be thinking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%, but I don't, but I don't see that it's, it's germane to the discussion we're having about how we're going to go about it. Paul, all we could do at that point is recommend to the city council I know that they do yeah, it. I know right. That. Right. I know and we that. would do that because okay. it's a great, great point. And one of our recommendations to the city council should be... And my be. other comment is this. I am totally aware that our city needs help. It needs it in schools. It needs it everywhere. We're not alone. However, I think that we should not try to be the leader in the stormwater management program. The ruling by a federal judge in Virginia has reached out to four different states that are going to fight this issue. They're not going to accept it. We've, I, I hate to interrupt this, but we've actually covered this every meeting. And it, it may be a very valid point, but it is not the focus. I don't know how much more valid you can be. I consider each one of you representing the EPA tonight. We are not. following We're, their mandate. Sir, we if I can just say to you, yeah. I, I've, I've listened to you speak each meeting, and I appreciate your input. I think that we all do, and your points are very important. I would recommend that you talk to the city council, your city council. I have, and I will. And, and the mayor about your issues as far as other grants and monies available to the city. What we're trying to do is set up a stormwater fee that's fair if we even have one. So di diverting attention from that from us, it, I'm interested in what you have to say, but this, oh, okay. this group I, I needs to focus right. on the fairness of the stormwater fee that might be implemented by the city council. I appreciate that comment. Might be. <coughs> might be. Might be. It's, I appreciate that comment. We're not making any decisions here. We're just I understand. banging our heads together trying to figure out what might work for the majority of people in town to feel okay with it. Fine. Uh, my memory serves correctly. The meeting that you had, the meeting that you had, uh, Dan, one of the items that was left on the table was the budgeting. So to that extent, I think his comments might be useful. The other thing that I seem to recall was that committee member McGrath was going to introduce uh, other means of paying for this. Is that not correct? Um, I brought up a few other things like from Chicopee and um, they were Other sources of money. Uh, yeah, that's the other towns had done, but they weren't um, according to our charge. So they but weren't that, things that. Does that come under the budget? Well, the budget isn't. The budget is the DPW's responsibility. You know, we at that early part of our discussions, I think, we um, were wrestling with our charge as it pertains, or is it related to the budget? And then I think we realized that the budget is not our discussion. It's really about... But I think the meeting that you left at, if you look at the minutes, you left the budget issue open. The meeting that you chaired, you left the budget issue open for further discussion. Have to check the minutes. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll go check the minutes. We'll check the minutes. We'll, and, and, and I yeah, don't know what happened, but we'll go check we'll the minutes. we go back to it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just go check the minutes. We can do that. Name? Yes, evening. Uh, my name's Alan Branch, uh, lifelong resident of Northampton, born across the street for we did. Um, I'm here to educate myself about this issue. I'm not well versed in it. This was my first meeting. And uh, I appreciate all the input and uh, thought thoughtfulness that you've given so far to this more complicated issue than I thought it would be. Um, speaking for um, the residential part of this, um, I I haven't heard you give positives and negatives to the approach of doing a flat rate, and I was hoping to hear more of your opinions about that. To me, it, to keep this simple, 
that would be the easiest way to do it. And uh, I'm very much concerned about what costs the city would incur going forward uh, with some of the other approaches, because I can just see that almost every resident is going to have a complaint about how it was, uh, how their fee was uh, developed. And I can just see the, the uh, people in power having to deal day in and day out with almost every resident in town. So I ask you, as you go forward, to try to keep it as simple as possible um, so we don't incur other costs um, as a byproduct of, of a, a more complicated uh, system. Um, the last thing that was mentioned about a cap, I think that would make a lot of people more comfortable to know that there's a finite number that we can all live with because we know we have this problem, we have to deal with it. Um, but it would, it would be a lot more acceptable, I would believe, to uh, most of the residents if we knew this was a, a real number and it wouldn't exceed a certain maximum. So I appreciate you considering that going forward. So uh, you're, you're, you're focusing on a cap on residential properties? Yes, sir. Um, or the amount of money that, that could be raised? No. Just a, on a, residential. A, a, a cap per taxpayer no, on the right. residential. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's your intent. But but I, how I much it could go up over the corresponding years, you're saying? Well, what it starts with, and, and to, to put some type of, I mean, it's up to you to make that recommendation, but so that it, it let's face it, um, as we get into some of the bigger projects, it's going to cost more and more, and I, I would be concerned about that, uh, that the growth is, is um, something that, that everybody in town can handle, I mean, with all the other taxes and so forth. Yeah. I understand we have to raise money, and I'm not speaking against that. I'm just, I'd like to make sure that people know that it's a reasonable number and not something that can grow to something that nobody envisioned when they set this up. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Mike Kirby, uh, 134 North Street. Seems to me you're losing some aspect of this this new system is it kind of encourages people to to, con to control their stormwater on site and, and get exemptions. By exempting the city, the city is in fact one of the worst offenders where it comes to dealing with stormwater. Uh, like the case of the Ryan School, um, the case of, of uh, Smith Bowl. In the case of the high school and the athletic fields, it's not a leader in um, the kind of things that Cooley Dick did um, in terms of detention ponds and etc. So I just wanted to say, A, this, the fact that this committee is very close to the city is going to be viewed with some suspicion, this decision to exempt the city. You know, that's one, okay? In other words, potential conflict of interest. You know, everyone who has on this committee who has either an em employee employed by the city, gets contract by the city, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so th that's my point, A. By exempting the city, you're essentially negating the pos potential positive aspects of making the city be a more responsible stormwater. Do you understand what I mean? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. 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 Uh, give somebody else a chance to answer. No, I don't see a volunteer. Okay, here. fine. Just, just a couple of things. Number one, uh, about agricultural land and the land that's on the other side of the dike. Uh, I'm not familiar with what goes on there exactly, but in general, farms nowadays have a lot of runoff of pesticides and all sorts of things that go into the river. Are they throwing a lot of stuff in the Connecticut River? And if so, shouldn't they be accountable for that? It doesn't come into the city of Northampton. Like no, but it goes into the Connecticut River, and that's part of the water DEP. Water quality issue. That's an issue that's that's uh, 
dealt with by EPA and DEP, the runoff from Parnway, yeah, and also looked at by uh, um, by the planning mm -hmm. department. Oh, yeah, that's an issue. Yeah. Further questions? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.